questions, if I could ask you please just to say which uh, outlet you're from, uh, Julian. Uh, Julian Barnes, Wall Street Journal. Um, I want you to talk a little bit of, about the uh, capability packages that uh, the defense minister has approved today. NATO has been uh, criticized uh, for having hollow forces, essentially units that have been undermanned or, or less than ready. Do the capability packages uh, that were uh, endorsed today by the defense ministers, will they address this? Will they make uh, NATO forces, particularly heavy NATO forces, more ready? And as a related point, how can you ensure the sort of new money that is coming in is directed to build the kind of capabilities you outlined today? There is a very close link between the defense investment pledge and the pledge to invest more in defense and the capability targets. Uh, because we need the extra funding to finance and pay for the new capabilities. And therefore, it is actually very encouraging to see that we are delivering both on spending, cash, and on capabilities. Uh, because we have seen a significant increase, uh, 46 billion US dollars over three years is uh, significant. It makes a difference. And uh, this additional money is then spent on uh, uh, also the new uh, capabilities. You are right that it's partly about creating totally new capabilities, but partly it is also about uh, uh, strengthening existing capabilities, making sure that uh, battalions, brigades, divisions, uh, military units of NATO are fully manned, fully equipped, trained, and have the necessary readiness uh, to be able to uh, deliver the um, needed uh, deterrence uh, of the alliance. So this is partly about manning, equipping, training existing uh, military units and partly about uh, delivering uh, additional units, uh, land uh, form form formations, uh, sea, air, uh, cyber. Uh, and uh, and uh, this is, uh, just to give you some examples, there are many, many, many capability targets, but this is partly about uh, providing more heavier, uh, uh, more ready uh, forces, more high-end capabilities. But for instance, we are uh, in, uh, going to increase our air defense capabilities. We are going to provide um, more uh, aircraft which are able to operate in uh, heavily defended areas, meaning uh, able to operate in uh, uh, areas which are uh, covered by A to AD. Uh, and uh, also uh, we are going to uh, increase the number of air defense ships and many other uh, capabilities which are needed uh, in the new and more demanding security environment. Um, Anna, in the second row. Thank you. Anna Pisonero from the Spanish News Agency, Europa Press. Could you give us a bit more a flavor of what the cooperation with the EU in, in uh, the fight against terrorism uh, will look like? Did you go into any kind of details? Um, I'm specifically thinking maybe of Iraq where the EU is thinking of setting up also a training mission uh, for the civilian forces. Um, and a second quick, quick question. When you say the summer for next summit, that means July? That is July. No? Thank you. Uh, in Norway, July is uh, regarded as summer. Uh, so uh, so uh, that's a good candidate. Uh, 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 but we haven't made a final decision on the exact dates. Uh, so we have started, in a way, to plan for uh, next summer, but uh, some final uh, decision-making has to uh, take uh, place. We have decided that uh, as it will uh, take place and broad support for, uh, for not only having a summit next year, but also have it in, in, uh, in Brussels. Um, but we will have to work on the uh, date and the formal decisions still uh, uh, remains. Then NATO has worked with uh, the EU on... Uh, uh, on, on the uh, fight against terrorism for many years, because we were together, or, and, and we have been together in, for instance, Afghanistan, where NATO has done work uh, uh, you know, in a very non-permissive environment uh, with our ISAF operation, and now with the rest of support uh, uh, mission, train, assist, and advise the armed forces. The European Union has uh, worked on uh, police uh, uh, also helping and, 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 and building police capacity in Afghanistan. And they also worked, you know, development aid and uh, civil society and many other uh, areas. 
So um, we have done this before, but I think we can do more. We also worked in, in other areas like, for instance, Kosovo, where we have worked on different tasks and also partly worked uh, very closely uh, together also in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So um, we have a long uh, experience of working together, but we, think, but we strongly believe that we can do more of, it, of this kind of cooperation in, in, in countries like, for instance, Iraq, uh, uh, EU has announced that they will uh, increase their presence there. Uh, NATO uh, has decided to increase our uh, activities in Iraq with more training, more capacity building, building defense security institutions, but also training Iraqi forces. Uh, so then we need coordination. So it's very much about partnerships, very much uh, uh, related to capacity building. But also I think that, for instance, our presence in the Mediterranean with the Operation um, uh, Sea Guardian, the, 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 the NATO maritime operation, working together with um, EU, is another example of how we are working uh, together. So there are many examples. Cyber is also uh, related to uh, the fight against terrorism. And I think the important thing to understand when it comes to cyber attacks is that there's absolutely zero warning time. So the, 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 necessi the, necessi the, 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 the need to be able to react immediately together is very high, and therefore I welcome that we have these technical arrangements uh, which, uh, which enable us to, to then work together uh, and uh, at the technical level uh, to respond to different kinds of cyber attacks. The lady in the fifth row. Uh, Epp and Estonian television, uh, have you discussed uh, also uh, uh, Russian uh, training SAPAD and what kind of preparations uh, NATO needs to do for that period of time? Um, the SAPAD exercise has been mentioned by several allies uh, and uh, it was also mentioned as, uh, when I visited uh, Latvia and Lithuania uh, last week. Uh, it is a big exercise um, and uh, it's yet another example of increased military activity uh, close to NATO uh, borders. Um, every nation has the right to exercise its, uh, its forces. Uh, the important thing is that this is done in a predictable, transparent way and in accordance with international agreements like for instance the Vienna document uh, which uh, requires uh, uh, international notification and also international observation. if. Uh, the exercise is bigger than uh, specific uh, thresholds. Uh, and uh, uh, we expect uh, Russia to uh, uh, follow those uh, obligations. They haven't done that uh, so far, uh, but uh, we expect them to, uh, to, to ad adhere to their uh, international obligations related to transparency and international uh, inspections of, uh, of the South Sapod uh, exercise. NATO is uh, transparent uh, when it comes to our exercises. Uh, we are not mirroring um, exactly what Russia is doing, but we are responding uh, to a more uh, assertive Russia. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have deployed uh, four battle groups uh, uh, in the eastern part of the alliance. Uh, and that's also one of the reasons why we are exercising our forces more and why we have increased the readiness of our forces. Uh, Terry, second row. Hi, Terry Schultz with um, NPR and Deutsche Welle. Um, on on Zapad, um, you expect Russia to adhere to these norms, but um, what are the implications if they don't? Uh, and and what, what's the status of your conversations about a possible NRC here before the summer? And a second question on um, everything from intelligence sharing to cyber cooperation um, and basically all of the counterterrorism uh, efforts that you're making. Um, what are you doing to increase the trust between allies so that they are more willing to share intelligence? This is always something that, that hamstrings any of these efforts that governments um, want to protect their own intelligence and it's, it's difficult to get very actionable items that, um, that will be shared. So how, are, are those also some of the efforts that you're making? Thanks. So on, on intelligence, uh, we have just established a new intelligence division, uh, which uh, has as its main uh, aim and purpose to improve the way we share intelligence uh, in uh, the Alliance and also to improve the way we analyze and understand intelligence. And we're also uh, establishing a cell which is going to uh, specific address uh, the risks of uh, terrorist uh, threats. Uh, so we are improving the way we are uh, sharing intelligence. And of course, we are totally dependent on also that allies share uh, intelligence uh, with each uh, other. 
Um, uh, on Sapal, perhaps it's too much to say that I, I expect, but at least I call on Russia uh, to respect the Vienna uh, document, uh, because that is an important document which uh, uh, has as its main per also the, 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 the aim or the purpose of the Vienna document is to make sure that you have predictability and transparency, transparency related to uh, uh, military exercises. And therefore, we respect the Vienna document, uh, but we have seen that Russia has used different loopholes and, uh, and, uh, and not notified and not, not, uh, uh, had, uh, uh, not facilitated international inspections of their uh, exercises for many, many years. Uh, but the more exercises, uh, the more important it is that the Vienna document is fully uh, uh, respected. We have also uh, called for or asked for uh, a briefing on uh, SAPAD uh, 2017 in the NATO Russia Council, uh, and uh, we are working for a meeting of the NATO Russia Council before the summer break. We have uh, suggested some dates uh, to Russia, and uh, we hope that we will be able to agree both on the agenda and dates so we can have a, a meeting on the NATO Russia Council. We have already have had meetings where we have uh, uh, had briefings on military posture and also. Uh, exercises, but now we would like to have uh, uh, briefings on upcoming exercises, and SAPAD uh, uh, 17 is, uh, is uh, uh, one of the exercises we would like to be briefed on in the, in the NRC. Uh, yes, please, gentlemen here in the center. Denis Dubrovin, TASS News Agency. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, uh, Russian uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Lavrov, will be in Brussels on 11th and 12th of July. Uh, do you expect uh, to have any discussions with him here at NATO? Thank you. I met uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, on different occasions. Uh, met him several times, uh, but we don't have any plans now to uh, meet while uh, he is in Brussels. Philippe Renier, Journal Le Soir. Uh, you already mentioned the um, cyber attack two days ago. Uh, could you say something more about your, um, your assessment about what happened? Uh, who is behind? Uh, was Ukraine the real target? And what is also the, the, the real concrete uh, added value of the cooperation with the, the EU uh, on, on that field? Thank you. The uh, added value is that uh, our experts, our teams, are able to work together with and share information uh, with uh, the EU teams and the EU experts. And they can do it in real time and they can do it immediately when we see a cyber attack uh, is, uh, is, uh, is coming. Uh, then, of course, much of the uh, practical uh, measures are uh, responsibilities of the different uh, member states, both of the European Union and of NATO. Uh, but uh, the importance of uh, especially NATO when it comes to NATO allies is that uh, we help them with improving their cyber defenses. And we also work together with partners. For instance, Ukraine was severely hit by the cyber attack this week. NATO has uh, activities, programs. We have a trust fund financing uh, uh, NATO help, uh, NATO support to improving Ukrainian cyber uh, defenses. We have a center of excellence for cyber defense where we share best practices, where we are uh, um, addressing uh, technologies. And, uh, and uh, we have also several allies which have developed you know, extremely advanced uh, technologies in different areas, and we are helping each other. So this is partly about uh, sharing uh, best practices, uh, sharing and technology, but also about uh, exercises and, uh, and uh, sharing information uh, when we see concrete uh, uh, attacks as we have seen uh, the last weeks. We have time for one last question, uh, gentlemen, uh, towards the back there. Kai, Kus Kai Kustner, ARD, German Radio. I know the Afghanistan session is coming up, but I'm having a general question you will easily um, answer, I'm sure. Um, what makes you sure the extra troops you announced will turn around the trend of uh, Taliban expansion in Afghanistan? And would you retrospectively say it was a mistake to withdraw um, combat troops in 2014? Uh, no, uh, that was the right decision. Is a if anything, we should have done it before. Uh, we should have started earlier to train the Afghans, earlier to enable them to take full responsibility for their own security. 
Uh, so it was not a wrong decision to end the NATO combat uh, operation and to uh, move into a train assist and advice uh, uh, mission. Because I strongly believe that in the long run, uh, it is much more sustainable to enable the Afghans themselves to take care of their own security, uh, to fight Taliban and terrorist, terrorist groups themselves, instead of having a large number of uh, German, uh, uh, UK, Norwegian, other troops from NATO allied countries um, uh, fighting uh, uh, in Afghanistan. So I strongly believe that uh, it's better uh, to enable local forces to stabilize their own country instead of uh, NATO combat troops uh, doing that job in many different uh, countries. So if anything, we should have done it before, also gone from a combat operation to a train assist and advice operation. What we are aiming at now is to not go back to a combat operation, but to uh, adjust, uh, strengthen uh, the existing uh, train assist and advice uh, uh, emission. And there are, uh, in particular, three areas where we see a need uh, to strengthen the support for the Afghans. Special operational forces, they have proven uh, key and critical in the fight against Taliban and, uh, and, uh, and terrorist groups. Uh, um, uh, air uh, forces, they need more planes and more helicopters, uh, both for uh, close air support, but also for medivac. Uh, and more and better leadership, so we are also looking into how we can strengthen military academies, uh, so uh, we can help them with better command and control and leadership. We don't think the situation in Afghanistan is going to be easy. Uh, we don't think uh, it's going to be peaceful and no conflicts and no violence there uh, 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 this year or, or next year or in the near, near future. But we believe that the Afghans have proven, or we don't, don't, not only believe, but we have seen that the Afghans have proven professional, determined and committed uh, to fight Taliban and to st stabilize their own country. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, we also strongly believe that in the long run, there has to be a political negotiated solution to the conflict in, uh, in Afghanistan. It has to be an Afghan-led and Afghan-owned political process. But there is a close relationship what, between what's going on on the battlefield and what we can achieve at the negotiating table. As long as the Taliban believes that they can win uh, the war, then they will not negotiate. So we have to break the stalemate. We have to enable the Afghans uh, to make advances, uh, uh, to regain territory, uh, and to, uh, uh, yeah, to break the stalemate, and by uh, that, uh, forcing Taliban to uh, really give real concessions at the negotiating table, and that provides the best uh, possible uh, uh, foundation for a political uh, solution. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.